you'll notice that the video stopped and so this is gonna be the second part of the video i had some crazy notifications coming in on my phone that i had to stop and so sorry about that okay now we're going to listen to on page 252 of your text the first text uh a piece titled in in the english translation in the wonderful month of may it was composed in 1840. i want you to listen to this and i want you to tell me overall how this piece affects you what did you like about it what didn't you like about it you will need to follow along in your textbook because it has the translation uh into english from the german so i want you to hear how the accompaniment how the vocal line treats the uh, the melodic structure of uh, uh, coinciding along with the text. So at this point, you can pause your video, okay? And we're gonna pick up with Chopin. Pause now. Chopin. The music of Frederick Chopin, he was, uh, again, died young, uh, born in 1810, died in 1849. His uniqueness was that he composed primarily, exclusively for the piano only. Uh, some piano concertos, but he didn't write an opera, he didn't write any symphonies, he didn't write any violin music or vocal music. He composed exclusively for the piano. He was brought up in Warsaw, Poland. Um, his uh, mother was Polish and his father was French. They were highly educated people. And when he was an extremely young lad, his uh, highly original style of playing the piano and composing absolutely astonished the, um, the aristocrats in Poland. He graduated from the Warsaw Conservatory of Music. As a young boy, he toured Austria and German playing his own compositions. That's another unique thing about Chopin and it made him uh, have his own style. People knew that when Chopin played, they recognized his music. While he was gone, the Polish people revolted against the Russian people, government. Learning that the Russians had conquered Warsaw, Chopin was filled with despair and guilt that he had left. And quote, Chopin said, they have burnt down my town. And here I am doing nothing only heaving heavy sighs and pouring out my grief at the piano, end quote. By 1831, at the age of 21, he left to go to Paris for the rest of his life, never to return. That would become his home for the remainder of his short life. Paris was the center of music, it was the center of art, still is to this day. Paris, if you're a musician or an artist, Paris is the place to go. It was the artistic capital of Europe. Chopin's playing quickly gained him fame all across France and Europe. But an interesting guy, he liked to play for the aristocrats, unlike Schubert. Schumann, they didn't, they didn't care about that. Chopin, on the other hand, he liked to rub elbows with the, with the rich and famous, if you will. The quote tells us here that numerous carriages brought the most elegant of ladies, the most fashion, fashionable young men, the richest financiers, the most illustrious great lords. An entire aristocracy of birth, fortune, and beauty, end quote. Chopin was shy. Uh, he did not like to play for large crowds, didn't like to play in big concert halls for thousands of people. That just wasn't his thing. He actually got nauseated when he had to play in front of a lot of people. So he basically played for his uh, circle of friends, the rich and famous, maybe no more than 50 or 100 people. When he did play a concert uh, in a large hall, uh, he hated it. It was not something he liked to do. He's kind of an odd guy. He's very short, about five foot one or two. Uh, when he stood up, his hands would reach to clear down to his knees. He had huge hands, uh, which complicates playing his music for many people who don't have large hands. He had a very good living teaching piano, and um, but he only taught to the daughters, not the boys, only the daughters of their very rich 
and famous and aristocrats. He met a woman who was a novelist and she had a pen name, George Sand, S-A-N-D. She was an odd duck. Um, she was a feminist. Uh, she liked to smoke cigars. And for some reason, Chopin fell head over heels in love with her. And they lived together for several years. And along with her daughter, and uh, actually about, about nine years, they, they lived together. And um, they separated. And w once they separated, um, Chopin's health deteriorated. And uh, he developed tuberculosis. And uh, he died then, uh, 39 years of age. Chopin expressed a great love for his country, Poland. Uh, when he died, he said that he wanted to be buried in Poland and France. The way that he achieved this was that uh, he told the people upon his death that his heart was to be removed from his body, taken to Poland, because he always said, my heart belongs to Poland, taken to Poland, buried there in a small coffin. <laughs> the dirt that was removed to make that grave was then to be returned to France and his body was then to be buried in Paris and that dirt from Poland was to be poured over his grave in Paris. He is buried. You can go to his grave to this day. It is a very famous cemetery in Paris. Uh, um, the likes of Jim Morrison of the Doors is buried there. Charles de Gaulle, former president, former president of France, is buried there. It's a, quite a tourist place. Uh, it was too cold when I was in Paris to go there, so I opted out on that one. The piece that I want you to listen to uh, is in your textbook, page 250. It is titled The Nocturne in E-flat Major. Um, he was about 20 years old when he composed this piece. Uh, we don't have an exact date on it. The word nocturne means night, and so it is a slow, lyrical, intimate, very subjective kind of composition, and um, very melancholy, which is quite typical of a lot of Chopin's uh, music. It's reflective in mood, and you can tell it's coming to a conclusion because at the end it has this very quiet, trill-like passage uh, before it ends very softly. Basically a very soft, flowing kind of music, piano only. So, I want you to discuss in this the overall uh, emotion and style and the reflective style that this piece conveys. Three or four sentences about it, and that's all, okay? So we're going to go ahead, and I'm going to have you pause your video. And then after you've done all that, and you'll get it going again, and we're going to pick up with the music of Felix Mendelssohn. Okay. Felix Mendelssohn. Felix Mendelssohn, too, again, all these guys died young, 1809 to 1847. Um... His romantic style of music was deeply rooted in the classical tradition. He was a highly trained musician. Uh, he was born in Hamburg, Germany, and his family was extremely wealthy. Uh, they were Jewish. His father was a banker, and his grandfather was an extremely well-known uh, Jewish philosopher. However, Mendelssohn rejected his religion, and he became a Lutheran. A Protestant, which was really frowned upon. There are different stories that the only reason he did that was because <laughs> he wanted to um, have more fame and make more money. And as a Protestant, he could get by with that. Interesting. By 1829, uh, he was only 20 years old, and uh, he conducted a setting of Bach's St. Matthew's Passion in London, England. He revised the music of Bach, brought, of Bach, brought all kinds of fame to Bach and himself. Mendelssohn was a very well-known conductor, uh, concert pianist, and organist. Uh, he played a Bach's organ music at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, thus reviving the music of Mendelssohn, which... Um, was um, a feather in his cap because without Mendelssohn, I don't know that the music of Bach would have come back quite as, quite as early. So he was a, a celebrity in his own right in not only Germany but England as well. Besides all of Mendelssohn's musical achievements, um, he was also a painter. He was a writer, 
and he was known in those days as a brilliant conversationalist and uh, round table talks that people like to have. He spoke fluently in four languages, and I believe those were obviously German, French, Italian, and English. He was a very polished guy. He was very charming. Everybody liked him. Uh, he was a star by every sense of the word today. Um, he was a friend of Queen Victoria in England. Every time he went to England, Queen Victoria made sure that he had a formal invitation to come see her any time that he wanted. Sad note of Mendelssohn's life, he had a good life. Sad, sad note of Mendelssohn's life is that he, he worked so hard. He was a workaholic, concertizing, conducting. He was one of the first major orchestral conductors as we know it today. And um, all of the concertizing and touring, it thoroughly exhausted him. He, he, wor he worked himself to death, but his sister died. And he um, was a happily married guy, had four kids. But when his sister died, she was such an important part of his life that the grief overtook him. It is said that he actually went to her grave every day to visit her. And over a period of time, he just couldn't take it anymore. He, um, he died. Many say that he died of not only the exhaustion of all of the touring, but also due to the um, loss of his sister. So now I'm going to have you listen to a symphony that he wrote. It's not in your text. You're going to have to look it up. And I'll say this carefully so you can find it. It is called the Reformation Symphony. The Reformation Symphony by Felix Mendelssohn. So you can look it up on Google or whatever site, you know, that you choose to go to to, to find this. I want you to write a few lines on the theme. Look up the title of that theme. What is the Reformation theme? What hymn is that based on? And then I want you to just write a couple, three sentences, four or five sentences about that, okay? So that's the Reformation Symphony by Mendelssohn. Again, you can go ahead and pause your video now while you listen to this composition, and then you can um, make your comments, write whatever, and then come back. And then when we come back, we're gonna pick up with our last two composers, Hector Berlioz and Peter Tchaikovsky. So go ahead and pause your video now. Okay. Program music. The music of Hector Berlioz and Peter Tchaikovsky. Romantic composers were particularly attracted to program music. Instrumental, instrumental music um, that would be associated with a story, a poem, a legend, some idea, or even a scene. And the one that we're going to focus on today is the Symphony Fantastique. Uh, the fifth movement of that is in your textbook, and I'll give you some stuff to listen for when we get that. Program music draws on the capacity of music to suggest something. Anything from sounds like bird sounds or a creek running or the rumble of thunder or anything like that. The earliest example, one of the earliest examples, not the, but one of the earliest examples is Vivaldi's uh, uh, Concerto for, for Spring. If you look back in your Baroque period, we find as early as, as that, that that Vivaldi actually wrote a programmatic piece on his Four Seasons uh, concertos. And he submitted a poem that you could read while you're listening to music. And in my opinion, it's kind of like the earliest form of cine, uh, cinematic music where um, you know composers are commissioned to write something for a movie and then they um, write that and uh, it's, um, you associate it with, with the show. Well, the same thing here. You listen to this composition, you see these things, you have visuals in your mind as to what that composition is about. Um, but most important about this music is that it has the ability to create a specific mood or emotion or even an atmosphere. Uh, the aim of most program music is more than just expression. It's also describing through music a particular scene or a mood or an atmosphere. A program symphony is usually composed in several movements. We learned that the typical classical symphony had four movements. An allegro, which is fast, 
a slow movement for the second one of some kind, the third movement, which is usually a, a minuet, and the fourth movement, which was a finale of some sort. By the time we get to Berlioz, of 18, this composition written in 1830, he expands that. Uh, that symphony becomes Symphony Fantastique, uh, becomes a, a five-movement composition, each movement with a different program, a different scene, a different poem for you to read, or a different uh, uh, prose or, uh, to read to tell you about what's going on. Um, its name alone, Symphony Fantastique, implies that it is a symphony with a program. Okay, it has five parts to it. The first one is titled Reveries, which means dreaming. The second one is a ball, um, like when people go to a masquerade ball or to the New Year's Eve ball. Okay, it's like a gala. All right. The third one is titled simply titled A Scene in the Country. The fourth one is the March to the Scaffold, where our guy gets his head whacked off. And the fifth one, the one you're going to listen to, is called. The Dream of a Witch's Sabbath. Um, and we're going to go over this when we get down to it after I tell you a little bit about good old Hector. Born in 1803, died in 1869. Keep in mind what's going on worldwide at that time. 1869, America's come in five years, four years after uh, the Civil War had taken place. But Berlioz is one of the first French Romantic composers to be so daring. Many people think that there would not have ever been a Symphony Fantastique in 1830 had there been a Beethoven Ninth Symphony in 1824. I kind of lead to that. His father was a physician. He wanted Hector to become a doctor. He wanted Hector to become a surgeon. Hector wanted nothing to do with that. The first time he had to go into the dissecting room and he had to do his dissecting class he uh, became physically ill and fainted, and they had to haul him out. And he said, enough of that. I'm not going to do that anymore. So he didn't want to do that. So at the age of 23, Beethoven, uh, Berlioz was overwhelmed by the works of Shakespeare. And he read Shakespeare, and he analyzed his works. And he went and saw this Shakespeare play, and there's this young actress named Harriet Smithson. And... He went crazy over her, fell madly in love with her. Even to the point of where today, he would probably be considered a stalker, <laughs> okay? And uh, he started writing her these wild, passionate letters. Uh, she thought that the guy was a lunatic, and she refused to even see him. He went into depression, he grieved, and he said, quote, if she could for one moment conceive all the poetry, all the infinity of my love, she would fly into my arms. Okay. Well, he described himself as an endless love. So what he did was he wrote this symphony fantastique in her honor, and he gave it a theme. And the theme is known to this day as the fixed idea. The fixe idea. You can't find it. I've listened to this thing so much, I kind of hear parts of it here and there. It's in there. I've seen it on the score. I've had it analyzed, and I've looked and say, oh, there it is. But for the general listener, you're not going to hear it. You're just going to listen to this piece and enjoy it for all of its moods and scenes that it, that it creates, uh, you know, through your ears. So in 1830, <coughs> Berlioz won uh, the Rome Composition Prize. He returned to Paris uh, from his studies in Rome, and he presented a concert featuring the Symphony Fantastique, or some, in some way, the Fantastique Symphony. In the audience, guess who was there? Good old Harriet. Kind of weird. She thought the guy was a lunatic, and here she shows up to the premiere of one of his major pieces. Well, she was taken back by this. I mean, to have a major, famous, well-known composer, whether you like the guy or not, write this huge composition because of you. And that said something. And it kind of gave Berlioz a little bit of false hope. The next day they met. And a year later, they got married. Um, 
I think the hunt was better than the actual catch for Berlioz. After they got married, he continued to have numerous affairs. Um, her young, youthful, beautiful looks and figure disappeared. She became a new... Uh, well, she gained a lot of weight. He lost interest in her, wanted nothing to do. They fought all the time. And uh, it was not a good relationship. So here he was. He fought and fought and fought so hard. Wanted this woman. She didn't like him. She was honored by the fact he wrote this very famous piece for her. So she went up and they got married. Uh, the courting part was, the engagement part was the best part of the whole relationship. Got married and after that, it really went sour. So now, a little bit about this great work. The Symphony Fantastique. It's in five movements. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each movement. If you want to, you can Google this and go on and listen to all five movements. Okay? Not a bad idea. If you want to write a little paragraph about each one, eh, might help you out later on at the end of the semester. I don't know. The Symphony Fantastic. Here is the program. If you go to a concert in which this is being performed, you will receive what I'm going to read to you now on the program. Movement number one, a young musician, Berlioz, of extraordinary sensibility and abundant imagination, <laughs> not bragging on himself or anything, right? In the depths of despair because of a hopeless love. That's kind of what we found out at the beginning about the two of them, right? He has poisoned himself with opium. Yes, Berlioz is one of the early drug users of the musical community. The drug is too feeble to kill him, but plunges him into a deep, accompanied sleep with weird sounds and visions. His sensations, emotions, and memories as they pass through his affected mind are transformed into musical images and ideas. The beloved one herself becomes to him a melody. A theme, the idea fixe, or the fixed idea, which haunts him continuously. Now, musically, a single melody, which barely was called this fixed idea, is used to represent her every time that it appears. That's the first movement. The second movement. The only one that's in your book is the fifth movement. That's the one you're going to focus on. So the first movement is titled Reveries. First he remembers that weariness of the soul, that indefinable longing, that somber melancholy, that those objective joys which he experienced before even meeting her, his beloved Harriet. Then the volcanic love with which he suddenly, which she suddenly inspired him, his delirious suffering, his return to tenderness, and his religious consolations. So the symphony opens with this really slow introduction. It's almost a movement in itself, the introduction is. It fluctuates uh, in tempo, and the moods help create a dreamlike kind of feeling. The second movement is titled A Ball. Like I said earlier, this is like a, a, a title like a gala, New Year's Eve ball. It's a waltz. And what happens here is the fixed idea comes in and you hear this waltz-like music being played. Um, it was a very popular dance in the Romantic era. And uh, so when you listen to this, you're going to have a feeling that when she comes into the room, he meets her, he sees her at this gala ball. The third movement is titled A Scene in the Country. In a summer evening, in the country, he, Berlioz, hears two herders calling each other with their shepherd melodies. The duet in the surroundings is a gentle rustle of the trees softly swaying in the wind. Some reasons for hope which had come to his knowledge recently all unite to fill his heart with a rare tranquility and they lend brighter colors to these ideas. But his beloved appears anew. There's spasms of contract in his heart and he is filled with dark premonitions. He always goes in the dark. 
What if she was deceiving him? Paranoia. One of the shepherds resumes his rustic tune. The other does not. The sun sets. Far off in the distance, you will hear a rumbling of thunder off stage, solitude, and finally silence. One of the shepherds is playing an oboe. The other one is playing a, a um, English horn. <clears throat> the fourth movement is titled March to the Scaffold. Here, he dreams that he has murdered her. He, he has killed his beloved that he has been condemned to death and is being led to the scaffold. The procession moves forward to the sounds of a march that is now somber and fierce, now brilliant and solemn, in which the muffled sounds of heavy steps give away without transition to the noisiest outburst. At the end, the fixed idea comes in for a moment, but like the last sound of love, it is inter interrupted by the death blow that is the guillotine coming down on him. Berlioz even commented on this. He said that the march of the scaffold is 50 times more frightening than I had ever expected. The fifth movement. This is a movement that you have in your desk, on your desk. And it's on page 235. Here, you can read the program yourself. He gives it to you. Uh, it's something like this. Here the artist sees himself as witches in the Sabbath, in the midst of their hideous crowd of ghouls, sorcerers, and monsters of every description, are united for his funeral. Strange noises, groans, shrieks, laughter, distant cries, which other cries seem to answer. The melody of the loved one is heard, but it's now lost its character its nobleness. It is no more the dance of joy. It's now a dance of trivial, grotesque. Has she come to the Sabbath? A howl of joy greets her arrival. She participates in this diabolical orgy. The funeral now the burlesque of the Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath, the Witch's Dance, and the Dance of the Dies Irae, the Day of Wrath, are all combined together. They're laughing at him. They're making mockery of him. The Dream of the Witch's Sabbath is the most fantastic movement of this entire symphony. It depicts a series of grotesque events. It is slow, hushed introductions immediately draws you, the listener, into the realm of the supernatural, evoking strange noises and groans and shrieks of laughter and distant cries. There are eerie sounding tremolos. There are even points in which you're going to hear skeleton bones rattling. And what he did was he instructed the string players to take the bows of their violins and turn them over and clank them against the back side of their instrument to create this clackety clackety sound of the skeleton bones. So what I want you to do is to turn to page 235 in the Ferris text. They give an entire outline of this particular movement. They tell you what's going on at that time, where you are, what to be listening for. <clears throat> and I want you to simply write a very short paragraph and tell me what you heard. Did you hear the musical interpretation as your textbook laid out for you? Did you hear the skeleton bones? Did you hear the eeriness? Did it sound like a witch's dance and a witch's Sabbath to you? So we will now pause the video and in a, start it after you finish listening to the, the Berlioz and I will pick up with the music of Peter Tchaikovsky. Peter Illich Tchaikovsky, born in 1840, died in 1893, and he is without a doubt the most famous Russian composer who ever lived. 
Tchaikovsky said, quote, I grew up in the backwoods, filling myself from early childhood with the inexplicable beauty of the characteristics, traits of Russian folk music. I passionately love the Russian element in all its manifestations. End quote. Tchaikovsky thought of himself to the fullest degree a Russian composer. He was a prolific composer. He not only wrote instrumental works, but he wrote vocal works as well. And without a doubt, he was the most popular orchestral writer to come out of Russia. He wrote such great works. Even if you've never seen them, you've probably heard of them. Swan Lake in 1876. Sleeping Beauty in 1889. What do you think Disney got the idea for that one? Christmas time, the holidays. We oftentimes hear symphonic orchestras playing the Nutcracker Suite. He composed that in 1892. Um, remember that he died in 1893. He composed that work just one year before he, before he passed away. The March Slav that he composed in the latter part of life. But the most famous one for me out of all of them is the 1812 Overture. And that's the one you're going to have to Google or to go on whatever site you want to go on to listen to. Now, the 1812 Overture <clears throat> is a mixture of many things. The piece was written for the Moscow World's Fair for 1770, 1870. And it is Russia's pride and joy. You're going to hear the French national anthem being played in this. It's to depict the defeat of Napoleon's army. Napoleon lost over 400,000 men in this battle when he marched them into Moscow to overtake Moscow. They didn't do it. Um, the Russians rose to the occasion and they took them out. You're going to hear Russian folk songs. You're going to hear gypsy-like style music, which depicts sitting around the campfire at nighttime when the battle has ended. They didn't fight necessarily at nighttime, it was mainly in the day. You're going to hear Russian dance music. And all these are going to be interrupted by the French national anthem, which depicts each time it becomes fainter and fainter and it builds, but it depicts that the Russians are defeating them. Towards the end, to depict that, victory. Berlioz scored this orchestra. And this is what we talked about. Um, the orchestra is becoming bigger and using all kinds of means to create what they wanted. They didn't have synthesizers in those days. So when uh, Tchaikovsky wanted the sound of a cannon, he actually used a cannon. When he wanted the sound of muskets being fired, he actually used muskets. Obviously shooting no bullets, but that sound. Uh, it was performed in what we know today as Red Square. Uh, the composition is around um, 18, 20 minutes in length. Uh, listen to it intently. Listen for these various folk songs. Do a little research on the 1812 Overture of Tchaikovsky. It will give you some insight before... Listen to it, then do a little research, and then go back and listen to it again. That will help you write your paragraph or two about this composition. Out of everything that you've listened to today, uh, in my opinion, this is the most important composition that we will explore. So take some time, spend some time on this, okay? Um, 1812 Overture by Tchaikovsky. So that really concludes what I want to present to you for tonight's class. Uh, you have plenty of time to work on this. And, and like I said, this assignment will not be due until Tuesday. Don't wait until the last minute to try to do all these. Do a couple a day or whatever. Use your... You know, use Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all the way up to Tuesday to get to get this done and email these back into me. Um, March 31st, Tuesday, is when this is due because next Wednesday, on Monday, I'll be probably sending out on Canvas again another announcement about what we're going to be doing, what you need to get prepared for, and so on. And then on Wednesday, I will be giving you another video presentation uh, that will follow 
this period here. We'll be getting into the area of Impressionism and Modernism. And uh, it'll be something very similar to what I did here, only different composers and, and of course, different music. So that concludes it today. If you have any questions, please email me. Uh, keep in touch. Let me know. And uh, I want to be sure that you get this video. So it's going to be uh, available. Well, you'll, by the time you see this, you'll know when it's available. Uh, but I'll be sending out on Canvas uh, what you need to go to to pull this thing up. So anyway, have a great week. Talk to you later. Bye.